I was born with twisted knees. And over the years, I've been on and off crutches. Now, one night, a few years ago, I got into bed, having left some hallway lights on. But I was too tired to get out of bed, hop onto my crutches, hobble 10 feet, turn off the light, hobble back 10 feet, and get back into bed. So I slept with the lights on the entire night and woke up in the morning thinking, well, if someone like me, an engineer managing a division at Apple with 37 patents, if I don't even have smart home technology, who does? Turns out, 91% of US homes were built before smart homes even existed, with no easy way to upgrade. Even getting an Alexa means rewiring every wall switch to connect to the internet to be able to talk to Alexa, then repeating speakers in every room to control those switches, and pairing every switch one by one through another app. And just the first step is 11 hours or $2,000. And that's if you own the home. If you rent a home, there's no solution. And this disproportionately affects the 27 million people with limited mobility. Veteran soldiers, older adults, disabled persons, who can spend up to an extra four hours at home on self-care daily. Now, why is this? Why do we have cutting edge technology which leaves behind the people that need it the most? And how is this relevant to all of you? Well, most of you here are C-level executives, operators, investors, looking to adopt or invest in new technology to help yourself, your residents, and your staff. But it can be overwhelming given the large number of technologies that seem to be out there. I mean, on one hand, you want to make the right choice. But on the other, potentially making the wrong one might cause more infuriation, staff disappointment, or just add more money. And so there are a couple of key things that you might notice in few of the technologies that are out there today, and we can find some clues. Meet the smart salt shaker. You shake your phone, it gives you some salt. Now, before you're quick to judge, keep in mind there are some people that need to be on low-sodium diets. And if I asked any one of you to build this, you would agree it's not trivial. You'd have to make the circuit, You'd have to write some code to make it work, and you'd have to find a manufacturer to actually build it. But the question you're probably all asking yourselves is, is this a problem that needs to be fixed? Not can you fix it, but should you fix it? The next question to ask is in some situations, is this problem solving a solution, or is this a problem that's being swapped for another problem? How many of you out here feel like you don't have enough apps on your phone, that just 10 more apps would make life much better? Well, this is a real user, and as you can tell, they have four pages of apps to control the smart home technology in their home. Now, if this user wanted to control their light, they would have to find their phone, unlock their phone, find one of these specific apps that they want to use, pick the specific light that they want to control, and finally turn it on or off. Is this really a solution that's solving a problem, or is it swapping a problem for a different problem? And finally, for some solutions, who are they being optimized for? Who are these remotes being optimized for? Is it for the typical user that just wants to turn on their television or change channel or volume? Or is this the result because it's being optimized for no one? Who are these solutions being optimized for? Now, it turns out there is a common link, a common thread that connects all three of the previous examples. And it's best explained by this graph. On the x-axis is your ability to do something. If you're a CEO, it's your ability to make strategic choices or manage risk. If you're an investor, it's your ability to make investment choices. Or as shown on the graph, maybe it's just your ability to walk. Now, all the way on the right are people with quote, higher abilities to do more difficult things. So maybe it's walk longer or faster. Maybe it's an Olympic athlete. And all the way on the left corner are people with limited mobility, someone using a wheelchair or crutches. On the y-axis are the number of people with that ability. As you'd expect, it's a bell curve. You're in there too. And of course, you guys are above average. 
Now, every time you make a decision or you create something for yourself, let's say you're an investor or you're a CFO and you're making a financial modeling spreadsheet, or you choose to buy or invest in a piece of financial modeling software, you are inherently picking a choice. You're making a spreadsheet or you're picking a software that works for your level of complexity and by definition, anyone who can handle higher levels of complexity. But by definition, as soon as you've made that spreadsheet or chosen a software that works for your level of complexity, you have left behind everyone who can't handle that level of complexity. And so the question is, why not start with the person on the bottom left corner, literally a corner case user? What would happen if you started with them? Because by not doing that, is why we end up with technologies that make healthy people healthier or fast people faster. That's the common thread between the previous three examples. So the question is, what would happen if you started in the bottom left corner? Well, I'm here to suggest that anytime you're debating adopting a new technology or investing in a new technology, ask yourself three simple questions. The first question is, is this the right problem to solve? Now, I understand that's a very high-level question, and so the real test is who have you not spoken to? Whose voices have been left behind? I'll give you an example. What if you asked older adults, not the people making the technology, but older adults, about their views on smart home technology? What would they say? Well, I did. For nine months, I interviewed people with different kinds of disabilities, no disabilities, and everything in between. And after nine months of research and interviews that lasted nine hours over three days, it turns out older adults are very interested in smart home technology, but they had these three preferences. They wanted smart home technology, but ones that didn't need any apps, didn't require you to do any rewiring, and didn't need to operate using the internet, either because they were in a rural area or it was too complicated to do the pairing and setting up and connecting things to the internet. So what if this was your starting point? What if you started here to build smart home technology? What could that look like? Well, what if you had a ring that you put on? And all you had to do was that, and this would eliminate the need to put a smart speaker in every room of the home, including private rooms, like bedrooms, where most people were not comfortable having a smart speaker listening in all the time. Step two. What if you could attach on top of existing wall switches using a switch cover that attached with magnets? Magnets would eliminate the need for any rewiring. And finally, to use the technology, what if all you had to do was point and click, like a TV remote? Using infrared like a TV remote would eliminate the need for apps, smartphones, and most importantly, internet. Essentially, you would have the ability to convert a home to a smart home in seconds and take it with you wherever you go, whether you're living in a rental apartment or traveling on vacation. Maybe you're already talking to your end users, your residents. Have you spoken to their family members? What are their top concerns? If you're already talking to the residents and their family members, have you talked to your staff? Have you ever had the situation where you've invested in, say, a fall monitoring technology that you love but your staff hates? Have you asked them what their top concerns are? Maybe it's your C-level executive staff that needs to be in the loop from the beginning. Maybe your CFO needs to be in the loop on the conversations from the start. Whose voices have not been heard? Now, let's say you've picked the right problem or the technology is focused on solving the right problem. The next question is, is this the right solution for that problem? But again, the real test is, who are these solutions being optimized for? Why not start with that corner case user? What would that look like? Well, here's an example. How many of you recognize this image? Well, it's Julia Child from back in 1972. And as it turns out, it was the very first television program that had closed captioning. Now, if you were an investor at this time and considering what closed captioning as a technology would mean, it would seem that it would help a very small set of people, right? It only helps people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Why invest in this at all? But if you think about it, we all use captioning or subtitles all the time. When you're watching Netflix at home, or you're at a sports bar where it's loud, or at an airport where they're trying to keep it quiet, or now 
even in social media. This is an example of a TikTok video where the person's speaking and the captions still exist. And this is from a senior living organization. You probably used it today or yesterday when you're scrolling on LinkedIn and you're watching a video with the audio turned off. Optimizing for a corner case user makes the technology scalable to all. Making it usable by an older adult or a person with a disability makes it simple enough or easy enough or light enough that when you invest in that technology, it is scalable overall. Why not start there first? So who are these solutions being optimized for? And finally, if you happen to stumble upon a truly cutting edge piece of technology, something that's not even on the market yet, the question to ask is, is this technology continuing to iterate with those voices that had been left behind? I'll give you an example. So remember that wall switch cover that I showed earlier, the one that attached using magnets? Well, it didn't always start out that way. All the way on the left was the first version of that switch cover. You can tell it's a different color. It doesn't even have a switch on the front. Now, if you'd done the first two steps and stopped there, or you were evaluating a technology that stopped there, you would have spoken to the right voices, picked a solution that was optimized for them, and yet have resulted in something that was on the far left. Well, as soon as we gave these to people, they said, well, this is great, but my significant other who doesn't have a ring hates it because now you've covered up that wall switch and nobody else in the house can use that switch. Can you please, for the love of God, add some buttons on the front? And so we did, which was the second version. And very quickly, the second piece of feedback came about saying, this is better, but those buttons are really small. Can you make them bigger, please? And as you can tell, the next version made the entire front surface a cover, a button, and gradually over time changed the color to adopt to wall switch plates. The question is, are you continuing to iterate with those voices? And so being investors, C-level executives, and operators, as you go about choosing which technologies to adopt or invest in, ask yourself three important questions. Is this the right problem to be solved? And the real test is, whose voices have you left behind? Second, is this the right solution for that problem? And the real test is, who are these solutions being optimized for? And the third, are you continuing to iterate with those voices? And if you do those three things, maybe, just maybe, the technology you invest in will not only change the lives of your residents, but maybe change the rest of the world. Good luck and Godspeed.